Quantum Rabbit, a Frankenstein podcast. I think non-Aboriginal people struggle with their identity. They know they don't have that continuous connection to the land and I've come to terms with that. I'm comfortable and, you know, I have special spots all over the place that I have stories of fishing or surfing or going away with mates and I'm fine with that. I don't kind of look at a piece of land and go, my great, 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 great grandfather's land's there. It doesn't make me feel any inferior as an Australian. That is the artist Matt McVeigh. I've known Matt for a few years, and he's putting together an exhibition called Australianiality. He's one of two lead artists working with the Holmes Court Gallery. He's also invited a bunch of other artists along for the ride, and some of us aren't sure, to be honest, where we're going with him yet. But it is going to be an adventure, and there's going to be a lot of talk around Australian identity. On a personal level, I feel like I've reconciled a lot of things because I do acknowledge that I, in every facet that I am on, you know, I don't like to call it Aboriginal land. I'm on land that is connected to Aboriginal culture of 65,000 years. Land ownership is always a disturbing one for me. I live on a continent which has been called Australia. The country I was born on is Wajat Noongar. But to sort of look at Australia and go, it's an Aboriginal land or which part, it's multiple cultures that are called First People or Aboriginal people's land. And they're very diverse. And the word Aboriginal is just a colloquial saying. It doesn't have any meaning to those specific places. And we've got to remember now that we live in a nation. We call this place Australia. And whether you agree on how that was set up, which I don't, that is the reality. And we, what we need to do is we need to look at what we've got and what we have is a treasure. We have the longest continuous culture known to man. Why don't we have more native agriculture practices? You know, why don't we know more stories? I mean, all that, I, I want my children to see Australia through Aboriginal eyes. Matt doesn't yet have any children, but metaphorically, he's made this his mission with a worldview that informs his art. He's done a lot of work with Aboriginal people via his arts practice, but being a white fella, he admits that a lot of his ideas can't be based on lived experience. So he observes things and tries to find some answers. I think all the ideas and sentiments are built around that culture is a way forward. And and, and people talk about this term, decolonisation. I think we should be thinking about how this country becomes indigenised again. Matt's not quite sure that Australia's on the right track at the moment, and he's developed his own opinion on the politics. It's become too militant, left and right. And I meet meet artists that I think are informed all the time, and they're they're actually, in their weird way, they're they're putting this barrier around it. I call it the sacred cow, and they kind of go, you know, they they want to decolonise, but yet they're so scared of having these discussions. And then in a weird way, when they approach the idea of decolonisation, it's so soft because they're so fearful of offending. And, I mean, it's, it's never going to be a comfortable conversation. And it's, I think he's right. I think if we don't Even making this episode, there's a little bit of that fear about, there, the fear of the uncomfortable issues. conversation or fear of saying the wrong thing. But it's hard for anyone to ignore that colonisation has caused a lot of problems in Australia. So when you bring up the subject of the Indigenous culture here, it's very easy for some people to focus on those problems and miss what I would consider to be the real content. And one example of that content that I wanted to talk about is songlines. Now many people think of songlines kind of simplistically as a song that represents a journey. They're sometimes called dreaming tracks or if there's a group of songs strung together in a sequence, they might be referred to as a song cycle. You can start to imagine these songs as lines on a map. And these paths that crisscross the country, this network of lines, aren't just about navigation. It turns out you can look at them more like a big internet. Our stories could be joined to Noongar people from hundreds of years ago, connecting all the time with others. This is Jimmy Edgar. He's an elder of the Yaru people in Broome, northwestern Australia. He spoke to us at a workshop in Perth for the exhibition. He's talking about what happens when industry comes in and changes the land. When you, we say, break areas of trees and whatever, so you, 
you start to think, oh, don't do that, because what you're doing is breaking up this uh, formation that was there for hundreds of years before. You know, it's like a giant internet, that sort of thing. And you have to try to join it, and they've got to try to join back again. Imagine you're on a journey, and you're travelling through a flat, sandy desert. Then, features in the land start to change. Up and down. Pretty soon there's big hills and deep valleys. And then it flattens out again. The sand is changing colour. And there's life. Shrubs and trees. Animals. Then the land starts to slope down and you follow it all the way to the bank of the river. We're talking about connection from hundreds of years of uh, storytelling and like a giant internet. So I'm looking at my computer screen at the moment and there's a graph that represents the filter of the software synthesizer that I was just twiddling with to record that little synth line. There's lots of little dots going up and down, up and down. And it kind of looks a lot like a landscape. So it's not hard to see how a song could be used to represent a journey, even just using sonic texture. With a lot more detail, that soundscape could be used to describe a lot more features of a landscape, especially when you add in the human voice. So in this culture, songs and stories connected to land are a form of data storage. If your neighbour wanted to go to the river that was described in that last piece, then maybe you could share the song. A bit like texting a location to your mate via Google Maps. Maybe. And your neighbour could share different songs with you. And there's probably a few that he doesn't share with you. But remember, this isn't just an ancient sat-nav. Songs and stories can be used to store all sorts of information. Hunting information, weather information, medicine information. Knowing the songs and stories of a place is almost like the European equivalent of owning a title to a piece of land. Anything you can make a song or sing about, you can remember. So by knowing certain songs and stories from some of your neighbours, you can travel a long way from home. So this network creates a living, breathing culture. And a lot of the ideas from this culture that we might consider ethereal or spiritual have at their heart a very practical purpose. Here's Richard Wally. He's a Wadjuk Noongar elder that also spoke to us in Perth. A lot of our, our stories that were taken as mythology or dreaming stories are actually being found to be guidelines and truisms about how you survive in a location. Whether it's the green ant dreaming, the disruption of land, all of these have got stories that are preceding what's taking place, whether it's mining in the north or deforestation in the south. There's stories to say why you need the forest. The simplicity is very sophisticated. And to try to just one little line, you try to work out the bloodline systems, that, that'll give you nightmares. And it was kept up here, handed down, not, not on a computer. Richard's touching on the subject of Aboriginal kinship systems. This is used to establish someone's relationship to other people and responsibilities to other people and the land and natural resources. As he says, it's complicated, but it's a system that's assured survival in a harsh environment for thousands of years. That's the beauty of us people. We always joining, making us feel good. Connections. We can't, we, can't, we can't claim kangaroo, we can't claim fish because they swim across each other and trees that overlap each other. That's the kind of interpretation we try to make other people understand. It's impossible to do anything but scratch the surface of the question, what is it to be Australian, in a 10-minute podcast. But it's been good to learn that the Indigenous people of Australia had an internet before we did. We're going to be exploring this question of Australianiality, as Matt puts it, a little further in the coming episodes, and we'll be meeting more characters involved with the exhibition. Thanks for listening.